You guys get to hear from Pastor Christian this morning. yoo -hoo! So welcome him as he comes and shares a word with you, his testimony. Thank you for pulling this out. <laughs> You're welcome. The funny thing was uh, when she told me that Pat was speaking um, after being 2-0, and o, I said, you got a plan B? She goes, no. <laughs> Little did I know I was that. Um, God has a sense of humor. Um, yeah, so I'm not really preaching a sermon. You guys are normally used to me coming up here and preaching a whole three-point message, and today it's, it's just the testimony. Um, and I was actually very hesitant when she asked me to speak because everybody she's asked so far, something bad has happened. <laughs> So I'm like, if I say yes, I'm not leaving the house Saturday. Like, I'm, I'm staying there. Um, I did leave. I needed gas and Zaxby's. Um, but the devil tried there. He, he kept my card. I got home, and I realized my card was still at Zaxby's, so I had to go back and get that. But I, I should have. Pastor Wendy, I can't do it. Um, debit card's gone. So, but eventually that came around to it, and I, I, I agreed. Um, so let's just pray really quick before we jump into this. Father God, we thank you for this time that we're together. That Lord, even though when things happen, it, it doesn't take you by surprise. That you knew exactly what was going to happen this Sunday. That it, you knew I was going to be up here telling my testimony. And Lord, I know it's not about what I say. It's not about the words that I have or, or what has happened through me. But it's only when your spirit comes in and works in the in-between that lives are changed. So God, I pray that that happens today. I can um my way through this message and fumble through it, but as long as your spirit is here, lives will change. So Lord, fill me, use me, and prepare our hearts for your spirit. And it's in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> starting all the way back at the beginning, I am the youngest of four siblings. I'm the baby. And I tell people the baby is always the best because... That just means my parents kept having kids till they finally got it right. <laughs> Special one. And so I'm, I can say that my siblings aren't here. <laughs> if they were the best ones, they would be. And so <laughs> <laughs> we're not recording this, right? Um, but uh, I actually wasn't planned to be born. Um, the only one that was actually planned was my sister. And... Once they got to my brother Taylor, he was a wild child. Like, I mean, I just ask her. She'll tell you more about it. And to the point of, she's like, I can't do this again. My mom was like, I cannot have another child because I'm terrified it will turn out like this one. <laughs> and so she made an appointment to go get her tubes tied. And um, that day, it was just like she said there was just something that came over her. And she's like, this isn't right. I I can't do this. She didn't know why. I believe it was God. Um, and she didn't. And then little did they know a little bit later, here comes along me, little Christian. And so I was born. They didn't decide on a name. My dad loved the name Christian. One of the names was like Tanner for you. And God, thank you. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> the day came and I was born and they still had not decided on a name, and my mom said she heard my dad out in the hallway making phone calls, and he said, hey, guess what? Christian's born. She's like, I guess we're naming him Christian now. <laughs> and that's the origin story of my name, in case you were wondering. And so, I mean, I, I was raised in a great family, raised in a great household. Like, this isn't one of those testimonies where it was like I was a crack baby or like I was an orphan or anything like that. Like, honestly, the beginning half of my testimony is very boring, but we need that foundation laid. So I was born going to church, and I went to this church for the majority of my life. And so much so that, like, I was baby Jesus in the Christmas play there, still have yet to outlive that name. Lynn played Mary, and so she's one of the people that still calls me Baby Jesus. So if Christian isn't enough of a name to live up to, Baby Jesus, that's, that's a big one right there. And so, um, yeah, yeah, that was my home. I loved it there. I grew up. I had my friends, and that was all I ever knew. And growing up, just like any other typical boy, I loved cars, and that was like my dream. Like, 
that was my aspiration in life was like I wanted to I wanted to open a shop when I was younger before I realized how difficult working on cars is and I wanted a muscle car and I wanted a jacked up truck and I wanted a lot um didn't understand money then either but the biggest thing that I wanted to tie all that together was my license that that was my my dream was like to be able to drive one day and to have that truck and so yeah I mean Pretty much up until eight, it's kind of a boring story, so I'm not going to really bore you with the details of that. So at about eight years old, you know, still going to the same church and everything, my father takes me on our first ever hunting trip. I mean, he's gone many times. I'd never been before. And we get out there. I shoot my first deer right between the eyes. Um, and, you know, I was ecstatic. I was over the moon. And I remember going up and walking up to the deer and then all of a sudden, I just remember, like, being self-conscious of all of a sudden we're at the hunting camp again. Like, the in-between of shooting the deer and getting to the hunting camp, like, I have no recollection of that. It, it's very weird. And we're pulling into the camp, and, like, it's, like, almost as though I'm waking up in tears. And I just, I just remember my dad going, what are you crying about? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I legitimately do not know why I was crying. I just know that I was. So I made up some reason. Um, and he's like, is it because we did this? And I was like, yeah, that's why. And I just had a raging headache. Like, that, that's all I can remember. And so I ate. I couldn't really swallow pills. So he cut open an Advil liquid gel. And he's like, here, suck out the inside. And that was horrible. That was worse than the headache itself. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, like, that was it. It was random. I didn't say anything about it. We just kind of, I swept that under the rug. I don't know why I blacked out for that short amount of time, but I did. And we just kept it tight. And, and as time progressed, these spells, if you want to call them that, happened more frequently, more often, to where it was almost like amnesia. I would be somewhere I had been before. It would be at church. It would be at home. It would be grocery store. At, even at school before. And all of a sudden, everything would look different. I didn't know where I was at. I didn't know my own name. I didn't know other people's names. I could function a little bit, but I couldn't answer basic questions. It would just come out as, I don't know, I don't know. And they would be like, okay, come on, Christian. And, and I could follow them. Like, it was manageable. It wasn't bad, but we didn't really know what was going on. We went to a few doctors. They didn't know what was going on. But it wasn't really life-threatening or anything like that. So we, again, kept it tight kept going forward and so a few years passed by and I'm about the age of 12 now this is where it starts getting juicy I'm about age 12 and this is where life kind of went down not just for me but my family and so I did very well in school in elementary school there were some issues within the school side of doing some sketchy things and trying to make those wrongs right I ended up skipping fourth grade going to fifth grade and this teacher, I used to say she was the Antichrist, but <laughs> that's not fair to the Antichrist. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. The Lord definitely has convicted me about calling her that, but she was not nice by any means. Um, she remembers. She treated my mom like a child, and uh, she wasn't good at, you know, it, it was just like, I should teach you one time, and then you should get it from there, and if you don't believe me that she wasn't nice, that same year she got fired for slapping a student in the face, so very old school teacher, but I get there, I'm not doing well in school anymore because of the teacher, and um, life starts getting more difficult, these forgetful spells are starting to happen more often, so I'm struggling a little bit in school, and then on top of that, my grandmother had just gone, you've heard Pastor Wendy talk about it before, just completely downhill uh, with cancer, with lung cancer. And to the point of we weren't really staying at home anymore. We would go home to shower, clean up, and change. But for the most part, we were staying at her house. And so life was kind of weird. I was missing some Wednesday nights. But it was just like this heaviness was coming over, and it felt like everybody was juggling. Everybody was struggling to carry the load at this point, and so my great-grandmother had just passed away, I believe it was a year prior, correct? Ten months, not even a year. Great-grandmother passed away, so my grandmother's mom. Then my grandmother passes away, 
And it was, it felt as though the world came to a halt. It was like everything flipped upside down for us. Uh, I, I wasn't able to do baseball that year because, you know, we were busy with that. And it was like, just to be completely raw and honest, it was like our family fell apart. Like she was that glue that held us together. Like she's the one that made holiday special. She's the one that like she would, she would go work extra and put all that money aside just to have like toys for her grandkids for Christmas. And like, I don't know, it was just like that magic at family events and gatherings, it was gone. It was just like sucked out. And it was almost like nobody knew what to do after that. And so my oldest brother, he was doing his own thing. He had moved out a while back and he just, he wasn't around. My sister, she was in the process of, of getting married and she was engaged. So she was, she was away as well. My other brother, he, he's not really the most comforting, like, person. He cares. He cares so much, but he doesn't show it that way. And then my mom, I mean, she was walking through something herself, and, and so was my dad. He, his father passed away not too much longer after, um, m- yeah, a month after that. And so it was just like everybody was carrying this weight, and it was just this darkness that we were feeling that, like, I can't even put into words what we were carrying, but it felt like nobody had anybody to turn to in that time. And so it was just like, just try to keep your head above water. It was the best we could do at that time. And so we almost all began to isolate and stay to ourselves and try to heal the best we can through that. And trying to come back together after that, it, it didn't feel like it was possible didn't feel like it was going to happen. And so um, alongside that, uh, my mom, it just became too much with everything going on. So she pulled me out of school and I began to be homeschooled, which I was cool with that. Like, I just want to stay home. And (laughs) and, um, I enjoyed it for like a month. And uh, (laughs) then I started missing friends. Um, But at this time, the forgetful spells started happening a lot more frequently, more aggressively, and um, my oldest nephew was just born at this time, and we watched him on Wednesday, or Mondays, and while my mother, since I'm homeschooled, she was taking a shower, and I was giving him a bottle, so I'm sitting on the couch feeding him, and she came out, and she was asking me, Christian, like, did he finish his bottle, and she said, I looked up at her, and I just had this, like, glazed look over my eyes, and I just, I don't know. I don't know. Like, that's how I kept responding. She's like, Christian. I said, I don't know. And then she looked down, and my foot began to twitch. And so she grabbed the nep- my nephew from me, and I went into a full grandma seizure. And she called 911. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm waking up uh, in the hospital. And finally, you know, we get to this point where it's progressed enough that the doctors finally have an answer for us. So at the age of 12, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. <coughs> And I remember sitting in that room with my parents, and they're like, yeah, y- you have epilepsy. And I'm like, what is that? And they're like, pretty much it's a fancy word for you have seizures, and we don't know why. And we don't know how to fix this. And I was, I was like, okay. Like, I, I was 12. I, I was like, <laughs> it's okay, cool, whatever. Like, it, it didn't really affect my life too much at that time. I was just that little optimistic child, you know. And so we were just going to take it day by day. And, and continue on li- with life. So a couple years passed by, uh, and my mother going into ministry, she had been doing some stuff at our last church with women's ministry and, and heavily involved, but the Lord had called her and us as a family to go to a new church. And so we did. And for me, that was hard because I grew up in the same church for 14 years like that I didn't know anything any differently I didn't know anybody else differently I didn't want to go but I didn't have a choice so (laughs) we went we made the most of it and I began to make friends there and and it was it was all right but it wasn't a healthy environment church wise I mean the left side of the church hated the right side of the church and they only showed up because the other side of the church would know that they weren't there that Sunday and and it was 
it was not a, a healthy environment. Our, our senior pastor, to the point of it put so much stress on him that he had a stroke. And it, it was just a difficult place to be, but I got involved while I was there. I got involved with tech. I started learning computer. I started learning sound, which is why I know that today, unfortunately. And <laughs> but I'm, I'm able to do that now. I got involved way with Royal Rangers. Like, that was my obsession at that time. I, I wasn't really happy with the youth group there because as the pastor's kid, they kind of had it out for you there. I got in trouble every week for talking, um, ev even though I didn't. I tested it. I, there was one, son or Wednesday, I came into youth, and I was like, I'm not going to open my mouth. Like, my lips will stay together this entire time. Even during worship, I'm not even going to open my mouth, just to prove my point. We get done, and the same leader pulls me aside and lays into me in the corner about, about talking during service again. And I, I knew it. And at that point, I was done. I was just like, I'm not going to youth anymore if I'm just going to get yelled at. And so... I got involved with Rangers and absolutely loved it. Got into FCF. I was working on getting my gold medal of achievement, which is like the highest thing you can get in Rangers. But I didn't fully achieve that because there's an age limit. And uh, I, so I wasn't able to do that. And I, yeah, we made the most of that situation. And as I was there, we were there for about four years. I was going into high school. And I went back to school around eighth grade. And as I went into high school, I'm about 15 years old now. And this is the first time I met Jadonis. We went to Kathleen High School together. And we were both on the wrestling team together. And he was like the only one that talked to me on the wrestling team. And uh, <laughs> he looked a lot different. <laughs> and he didn't have the beard. Had a little bit lighter hair, a little bit shorter. And I couldn't remember the name Jadonis which is fair. I mean, I feel like a lot of you guys struggle with that name too. I mean, you know it now. But he kept telling me, no, my name is Jadonis, my name is Jadonis. And I was like, bro, you look like the guy from the movie Sandlot, uh, Ham. I was like, <laughs> I was that kid. I was like, do you mind if I call you Ham? And he's like, sure. You're killing me, small. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he said he's never watched the movie. Um, <laughs> That's why he was cool with it, uh, <laughs> apparently. And so he was known as Ham. But to the rest of the school, I was known as Taylor's brother. <laughs> My brother graduated the year prior to me going in. So there was a lot of teachers that knew me. And I didn't know whether it was for a good reason or a bad reason. They were like, Hargrove, you Taylor's brother? Yes. <laughs> All right, come sit next to me. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we joined the wrestling team, and, and so that's where we first met. I mean, we weren't the best of friends, but, you know, we knew each other. And at this time, um, my seizures were getting significantly worse. They were more grandma than, than anything, and they were cycling me through a bunch of different medications, trying their best to get it under control, but really it was one of those things where it's like, let's throw whatever at the wall and see what sticks. And if it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And the downside is these medications were doing significantly more harm than they were doing good for me. And so there was a lot of side effects that I <laughs> had to go through and walk through that it wasn't, it wasn't worth it in the long run. And so it's just like constantly changing. And I, I just kind of got to the point to where my parents were like, take these pills and I didn't even ask the name of it. I'm just like, okay, pop them, go. And my mom said, there is like every day, she said, when I would drop you off at school, I would just cry as I drove home because she's like, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I, I didn't, I wasn't there to help. And as an adult now, I have so much more uh, empathy for my parents in that situation because I can't imagine what it's like to have a child like uh, that struggles with seizures or a health condition and as a parent you are helpless there is nothing that you can do except take them to appointments make sure they're taking the right ones but I mean I've, I've watched my oldest brother have a seizure before and it's terrifying to stand there and, and see it happen and it's like I I can't do anything I'm I'm helpless 
And so for me, <laughs> it's going to sound weird to say that I had the easy part. I just flopped around on the ground for a little bit, and the next thing I know, I'm coming back too. For them, they had to watch it every single time it happened. They had to carry that burden and be concerned and, and really change their life to cater to me and, and, and what was going on with my life. And so uh, these medications, w one of the problems, I rewind a little bit. Um, when I would have a seizure, it, it's basically like your brain is rebooting. Like that's how the doctors described it to me was like, think of a computer and your brain is like a mega computer and you've got all these like electrons firing off in your brain and they have to go off in a certain order. But something will throw that order out of whack and then your brain will just start firing off, trying to get it back in order. And then if it can't get your brain back in order, it just reboots and shuts down. And so when that would happen, I a lot of times struggled with memory loss. And so I'd go to school, I'd sit through these classes that everyone else is sitting through, I would learn what they're learning, and it's not that I was dumb, it was just I would have a seizure and I wouldn't remember what I learned. I had memory loss issues. And so even to this day, between 14 and 17 years old, it's kind of a blur to me. I don't remember much of my teenage years. And <coughs> so <laughs> I would learn it, forget it, and then try to catch up over, over time. And that just kind of put me way back behind everybody else. And the school had meetings with my mom, and they're like, look, because he's struggling, because he's falling back so much, we want to put him in an ESE class. And she was like, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. Like, he's going to carry that title with him for the rest of his life if he does that. And then the medication I was also on at that time, it made me dizzy in the mornings. And so I remember during finals, walking into class, and I sat down at the computer to take the final. It was all multiple choice. And even though there was one screen, I saw three. And it was, they were all moving. Like, I could not read the screen to take the final. But, of course, it was an embarrassing thing to me. And I didn't want to say anything. So I did the only logical thing. <laughs> I clicked C for all of them. <laughs> and, of course, <laughs> I failed my finals. And they wanted to put me in intensive math next year. And so instead, I got pulled out of high school towards the end of my freshman year. So I was dealing with those side effects, and um, trying to catch up on my notes. I don't want to miss anything. And as I'm being homeschooled, the side effects began to get a lot worse. And to the point of, it, my parents said the best way they can describe it was I was a zombie. They were like, you were you were there, but you weren't there. You were emotionless. You, you had no drive to do anything. It was just like, okay. And, and, and I would just exist, essentially. And I, I didn't really have a lot of friends that I could go hang out with. I didn't have a, a lot of uh, opportunities to leave. I felt almost like a prisoner within my own home. Church was kind of my only activity or opportunity to go out. It was, it was very emasculating for me at that time, but... I understand why my parents did it. I understand they were, they were trying to uh, protect me. Um, some other things that happened at that time is uh, my lower back, it looked like somebody took a razor blade and just went to town on my lower back. The scars have faded a little bit by now. They're still there, um, but that was from having a seizure, falling on my back, and what I landed on, it just gashed up my lower back, and, and this isn't anything against my father, and I don't think I've ever said this or told him this, um, but I started wearing a shirt around the house because he, he said something to me, and it wasn't to come against me. It, it was just him being open and vulnerable and honest with me, and he said, Christian, whenever you don't have a shirt on and I see those scars, it hurts me because it's a constant reminder that I wasn't there to catch you, and I was like, I, I, I'm already putting them through enough. I can't I can't keep making them go through more of this, so I made sure to cover that up, I wear a shirt as much as humanly possible. I, I hadn't slept with a shirt on since the day I was born, um, but that started becoming a common occurrence for me because I didn't want him to feel as though he failed at something he had no control over. And so 
um, yeah, I, I mean, I was, I was a zombie. There was one day I was walking through the kitchen, and my brother being what brothers do, um, he just punched me in the arm pretty hard. Like, you, you heard it. And I just kind of ate it and kept going, just walking, like, unfazed. And my brother-in-law grabbed me and, like, pulled me aside, and he's like, Christian, why do you let him do that to you? Like, I see him hitting you and messing with you all the time, and you don't do anything about it. And it was just like a, an epiphany to me. I'm like, huh, I guess I could do something about it. Like, I've never, I've never thought of that before. Why, why haven't I thought about, you know, swinging back or, or, <laughs> or calling him a name or something like that? But now, looking back, I can see, and like, I know why I didn't do anything, and it was because there was nothing my brother could do to me that would compare to the living hell that I was walking through in that very moment. It was nothing. It was peanuts compared to, to what I was feeling. Because another side effect that of the medication was depression. I was very depressed. And I, I hated life. I, I hated everything about it because now I'm approaching the op time where most people are getting their driver's license or their permits, and I couldn't do that. I remember sitting down, like that was my dream since I was a little kid. And I remember sitting down at a restaurant with my parents and just going, I'm not getting my license in life. And they said, no, at the rate you're going right now, if nothing change, if something doesn't change, you're not getting your license. And I was like, okay. And so it was like, I, I had nothing to look forward to in life. And, um, and so, I mean, this, this was my rock bottom. Like I said, I felt like I was a prisoner in my own home. I felt very emasculated. And then, and then the enemy began to creep in and I began to talk a lot. And for me, I felt as though I was a burden and I was a waste of space. Because I'm looking at all my siblings, gifted and talented and amazing, and I had nothing to offer. I was like, my oldest brother, you know, he's... He's a fabricator. He can build anything that you need him to. Just amazing at, at that kind of blue-collar work stuff. My sister, you know, had a, had a great voice, and she could play the piano and the guitar, and, and she was very musically inclined. And then Taylor, oh, Taylor, <laughs> he ticked me off because anything he touched, he had that Midas touch. He was just good at it. You would practice a skateboard move all day long, and he would come home and try it like three times and then nail it. And it's like, <laughs> you suck. <laughs> I'm telling my testimony, I can say that. Um, and I just, I'm looking at everything they have to offer, and I'm like, I don't play an instrument at the time. They want to put me in an ESE class. I'm not intelligent. I, I can't play sports. I'm confined to my home, and everybody has to change their lives to cater to me. And I reached the point where I said, everybody's life would be so much better in my family if I wasn't here. They could go about their business. They wouldn't have to worry about it. They wouldn't have to be concerned with, with what's happening to Christian. What, what's going on? Is he okay? We have to take him to doctor's appointments. We have to stay up late and make sure that he doesn't get uh, a certain amount of sleep for the test that he has to do tomorrow. Like all these hoops that they had to jump through. And I was like, I'm the issue. I'm the burden. And so I, I, I finally reached that breaking point where I was like, I'm done with this, God. I was like, I've been faithful. I've, I've, I haven't stopped going to church I've been more consistent than my other siblings, but why is this happening to me? And God, I, I, what was that, 16? If this is all the rest of my life has to offer, I don't want it. It's not beneficial. I'm not helping you. I'm not helping anybody out. So I made that decision that night that I was gonna, I was gonna commit suicide. I was done. It was difficult because being the son of a firefighter, I'm hearing all of these horror stories of people attempting to commit suicide and it going wrong and them living, but now they're a vegetable. Now they're, now they're dealing with this. And so like I'm sitting there and I'm like, what is my foolproof plan? How do I do this where it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out completely? And I, I think this was a God moment. And it was like a, a couple of days prior, the thought ran through my head. 
of my brother who was going through fire school. And he was just having to learn how to deal with, these, with people that do commit suicide. And he was angry. And he's like, I hate when people commit suicide. And, and he told us his opinion. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was along the lines of they're cowards. And I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree with his statement, but that thought did cross my mind at that moment of those words that my brother said. And so then that, there was the other side of my thought. It's like, okay, but what if I do this? What will my brothers think of me? That I was a coward? That I couldn't fight hard enough? And so as that battle went on in my mind, I mean, it was late at night. I got to the point where I'm like, I don't even, I don't even believe that God exists. Because if he was righteous, if he was just, why would he be doing this to me? Of all people, there's worse people in the world that he could be doing this to. Why would he be doing it to me? And so I prayed to God. And this was going to be my final prayer. And I said, God, I don't care what you say. Just say something, anything. And if you do, I'll know that you're real and I will follow you. I'll continue to follow you. And if you don't, then I'm done. I'm ending it. I'll find a way. I'll figure it out. And so I finished praying and I sat there and waited for God to say something. And I waited. And I waited. And sure enough, he said nothing. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't good enough. Like, I, let me just take one more shot at this just to, to, to see if he's real or not. And so I went on Google, of course, and I typed in evidence that God exists. And a sermon popped up. And I was like, all right, let's, let's watch this. Okay, a lot of views. Quality looked good. And uh, keep in mind, I have not felt emotions for years, whether it was joy, whether it was sadness, it was just nothing. And by the end of this sermon, I was in tears, crying. And the sermon, I forget who spoke it, but he was talking about laminin, which is the rebar of the body, essentially, that keeps everything in order. Never heard of it before. And he showed a photo of it, and laminin was in the shape of a cross. But it wasn't about the words that the guy was saying. I don't even remember who said it. It was about what the Holy Spirit did in that moment, where, where he, he saved me from myself. It doesn't matter what the pastor said. It, he was just a vessel for the Holy Spirit, even through a video. And I just began to cry. And I said, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I ever doubted you. I'm so sorry that, that I, I had strayed away and done my own thing, because I was no saint. At this point in my life, you know, I'm dealing with all of this depression. I'm reaching for anything to, to help me in that moment. And, of course, like most teenagers, I was addicted to pornography. I swore like a sailor. Like, like I was the opposite of my name in that moment. The only reason I went to church was because that was my only outing. I, it was, I said I was a Christian, but I really wasn't. And that's why I'm so passionate about preaching about that today is because I know what it's like to play the part of Christian. I know what it's like to come in and raise your hands in church. Like I went through those motions for 16 to 17 years, but it wasn't until I met God on the floor of my room at 16 years old that I realized everything I was doing wasn't actually real wasn't actually intimate that I had never pursued God. It was transactional. God, I'll, I'll pray to you and I'll ask you to do this for me. And in return, I'll come and worship you in church on Sundays. I'll come to Rangers. I'll, I'll come and attend. I'll tithe. I'll give to Buddy the Barrel. Like, I will do all of these things. And in return, you be my little genie in a bottle. And that, that was my relationship. Uh, not even a relationship. I don't want to even call it that. And I, I just wept that night. And I said, God, I am so sorry. And then he spoke to me. And he said, you have such little faith. And that was like a knife to the heart. And so I told him in that moment, I said, God, I don't care if you heal me or not from these seizures. I'm not going to follow you because I know you can heal me from this. I'm going to follow you regardless of that. Because I had people praying for me. 
I had, a, I had church full of people praying for me that would come up to me. My dad would tell me, he said, Christian, every morning I pray for you. Whether I'm at the fire station, whether I'm at home, I'm praying for you. And I'm like, I know God has to be here. No, they're filling his inbox right now with prayers. Just respond to one of them. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> And so I said, God, yeah, regardless of what you do, I'm choosing you. Not for what I can get in return, just because you're there, because you're God. And so the only Christian song I knew in that moment was Oceans. And so I've turned on Oceans, <laughs> which was actually a good song at that time, um, before it was overplayed. And I just sat there on my floor and cried. And to the next day was like my, my repentance moment. I mean, it, I wasn't a, a, a glorious, saved, clean person in all of my actions. I mean, that, that's why we believe in the process of sanctification. It took time for me to be consistent in my word. It took time to be careful with how I used my tongue. It took time to have self-control and not give into the flesh. And even today, I'm still human. People cut me off in traffic, and I, I, I go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and somehow that pinky toe always finds the corner of that dresser, and sometimes you say things that God wouldn't be proud of. You repent after, <laughs> but it, it, it took time, and, and once I did that, it was like a switch was flipped, and my life was just put on like into another gear, and things started changing. We weren't going to church at this time. There was a, a fault. I don't even want to say falling out at the, our old church, but it was just like things just kind of fell apart. And we knew it wasn't the healthiest place to be. We don't want to be here. The last church we were at prior, uh, they had from the pulpit, from the stage, said lies about my family. And we parents didn't really want to go back there, understandably. And so we were just trying to figure out what the next step was. And we were just at home. And they asked me, they're like, Christian, we... Not big fans, but we know you have friends there, and we want you in youth group. Would you want to go back? And I'm like, yeah, I would, I would love to go back and be with my friends. So they started dropping me off. Actually, I think they stayed um, while I was there, and I just started getting involved. I became that front row kid in youth group. Like, I just got this new hunger and fire for God. It wasn't about hanging out with friends anymore. It wasn't about, you know, coming in and playing games and winning prizes or going to youth camp and all that. It was like, it was about God. And that was it. Because I, I got to the point to where I did life my own way. I tried to fix things my own ways. I tried to rely on the doctors. I tried to rely on the medications. I tried to rely on everything of the physical world. And none of that worked. All of it failed me until God. And so now I was like, I give you my everything. I started taking, I think I knew bass at that time. I knew how to play the bass. And so I started getting involved in a worship team playing bass. Every event my youth group had, I was at it, and I was getting involved and, and uh, getting poured into. And then fine arts rolled around that year, and they said, Christian, what do you want to do for fine arts? And I told her, I, I don't know why. I'd never done it before. And I was like 17 at this time. I was like, short sermon? And she said, okay, cool, all right, cool. And so uh, I think a lot of y'all know Jarit, so she's been here before, my adopted sister. Um, and she coached fine arts growing up, and so I called her. I was like, Jody, I'm doing short sermon. I don't even know where to start, bro. Like, what, what am I supposed to do? So, like, every night we were on the phone working on my short sermon. She's like, why don't you tell your testimony? Why don't, why don't you talk about what you had to walk through? And I was like, all right, that's good. And so the biblical story that, that I pulled from was Jochebed, don't know, is the mother of Moses. And the absolute faith that that mother had to have to place her baby in a basket and let it go down the river and trust that God had it. That takes some faith. And I started asking all she wanted. All she wanted was a normal life. All she wanted was a normal family. All she wanted was to just see her baby live. And at the end of the sermon, I said, all I wanted, all I wanted was a normal life. All I wanted to do was just go stay the night at my friend's house during the summer. All I wanted was my driver's license. I just wanted to be healed. And that night, as I stood on that stage and I preached it to the congregation of our church and some visitors, I know Steve and Jen were there because they came up and they said something to me after. 
but I was able to stand on that stage, a boy that was having a seizure multiple times a week, sometimes a couple a day, a couple a day, and I was able to stand on that stage and say, I stand before you guys today a year seizure free. That it was the moment, yeah, give God praise. (laughs) Now I look back at that, and I understand why God took me through what he took me through. It wasn't a punishment. It wasn't him being angry with me or judging me or anything like that. He was just trying to call me home. He was trying to tell me, like, look, I have greater things, greater purposes for you, but the life you're living right now, is it, it, you're not going to be able to fulfill that. You're not living for me. But the moment I gave my heart to God, it, it, I didn't have a single seizure after that. And I, I don't want to do the math right now, but I haven't had one since I was 17. Right? 16, 17. She remembers. Yeah. My accountant. Um, remember, memory problems. Um, nine years. <laughs> so I haven't had one since. And the Lord healed me from that. And I, I got up there and I did my short sermon at Fine Arts. And I didn't go to nationals. I, I took a five minute sermon and was able to do it in two. Um, <laughs> I flew through that thing. I didn't go to nationals, but it was in Faith, Orlando. I remember walking out of that room, uh, going through the crowd as they're, like, patting you on the back, and they're like, good job, walking out to the ledge and looking out into the lobby and going, this is it. Like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And so at Faith, Orlando, I was called into ministry. And I was like, this is it. This is my direction. This is my purpose. I have something to, to fulfill in life now. And so next year, of course, I did uh, fine arts and um, did short sermon again, and uh, I made it to nationals that time, but I didn't care because in a few months I was leaving to go away to Bible college. I was super pumped for that, and (coughs) I finished up there, came back home. The Lord shut every door for me to stay there. He was like, you're coming back home, and as I I came back home, he just continued to open doors for me. I, I 19 years old, jumped straight into ministry as a middle school youth pastor, and now I've been in ministry for six years, and yeah, six years, and I've been following him ever since, and this is how I've gotten to the point to where I am today, where he's continued to bless me. Has it been easy? Absolutely not, but this is where I I like to look back at the moments similar in scripture like Jochebed, where it's like, I, I don't know what the end result's going to be, but God, I, I trust you. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That, um, there's a song, I can't think of it at the top of my brain right now. Even if you don't. And that's what they were saying. And they said, look, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to do what you say. Put us in the fire. Our God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't we're going to worship him. And, and that's, that's the heart that I had, and I feel that is the heart that we need to have as followers of Christ. Yes, we want God to intercede. Yes, we want him to heal. Yes, he, we want him to change our, our situation and our circumstances, but what if he doesn't? Are we coming in with that heart posture of even if he doesn't, God, I'm going to follow you. And so as the worship team makes their way back up, I just want to finish with this scripture. And I know I didn't really give you guys a a title, but I saved that for the end. And the scripture, it's going to be up on the screen, Acts 16, 23 through 33. It's talking about this, uh, Paul. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, the darkest time of the night, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison's doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. 
because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. In that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. When I read that story, you know, it, we can read it, and we like to put ourselves in the place of the main character. I'm not Paul. I'm not even Silas. I'm the jailer. And when things weren't going right, and I reached that breaking point, and I was ready to take my own life, I was ready to end it, but God. It's, at, it's always at that darkest moment. It's always when it looks like there is no way out, there, nothing is going to change, that he's going to, to shake your foundation. He's going to throw doors open, and he's going to give you that opportunity. But are you going to wait around long enough and accept him? That through the darkest moments that you're going to praise him through it. And so as I, as I close today, the title of my message is Praise Him When There Seems to Be No Way Out. And so I know there's some of you in here today <coughs> that are dealing with physical ailments. Maybe mental, maybe um, circumstantial, maybe financial, all the O's. I know there's something coming to mind right now where you've been praying and you're saying, God, I need you to intercede. God, I need you to save my, my brother. I need you to save my sister, my mom, somebody. God, I, I need you to work on their behalf. I need you to, to shift. And I, want, I, I believe that our God is a healing God. I've watched him do it. I've watched him use me to pray for others and watch God use me to heal them. He was doing it. I was just a vessel. And so I, I full, wholeheartedly believe that if you're dealing with some kind of ailment today, you can be healed, and I'm going to pray for you. But as we step into this song, regardless of your circumstances, it is impossible to be anxious and worship at the same time. It uses the same part of your brain, so if you're anxious, you're not fully in worship. You're still concerned. I said it in our guys group. Um, anxiety is the belief that God's going to get it wrong, and disappointment is the belief that he already did. And so as we sing this song together, let's praise through it. And in the dark moments, say whatever you do, God, whether you do it or you don't, I'm going to worship you. Because you're God. You're worthy of the praise.